introduce James. He uh, is a co-host of a podcast, uh, The Two Naris, which um, we spoke about the, about the last day. It's actually on your list as well to, to listen to, which is it's brilliant with himself and, uh, and Timmy there, two lads in Cork who are uh, having really, really brilliant, uh, brilliant podcasts. Uh, and I was looking there, James, trying to get your job title. You're a, a team leader in Cool Mind Treatment Centre, aren't you? Yeah. Brilliant. And uh, you've worked a lot with Simon Community and other uh, resources for marginalised people, but I suppose the your path to getting there is a, is a long one. Yeah. Do you want to tell us a bit about yourself growing up and the area you grew up in, maybe, to start with? Yeah, thanks, Rory. Uh, look, it's, it's great to be here, and uh, I admire the work you're doing, and I'm very happy to help out in some small way. Um, I'm from Nakanahini, Holly Hill area of Cork City, um, which is the north side. It's um, a great area that I've known all my life, but I suppose people that aren't from there think it's the wild, wild west. It's not really, but it does, it does have some social issues. Um, it's an area predominantly of social, nearly exclusively of social housing. And where you have social housing, you have a lot of social problems. You know, we have a lot of uh, lone parent or lone parent families, a lot of um, high rates of unemployment, um, substance abuse, mental health issues. Um, that that's kind of where we grew up. So in my area, if everybody mutes there, because I'm getting a small bit of feedback, but um, in my area, as I was saying, there's a lot of poverty, social exclusion, that type of thing. A lot of drug use and um when i was growing up the people in the community that uh, from my perspective and my peers perspective the people in the community that had status for people that were involved in crime people that were involved in joyriding um people that were involved in drugs they were the people that we looked up to you know you have to like in our area there's no nobody in our estate was going to college. There was no teachers or guards, or guard or doctors or nurses. Or we didn't have that. You know, it was um, manual laborers and cleaners. That was kind of it, really. You know, so you, you don't have that um, cultural capital as as I learned later on in college. You know, just to, you don't have that culture of. If somebody comes to, if a child comes to their mother and the mother, I want to be a vet or I want to be a doctor, I want to be a teacher, there's literally nobody in the area doing anything like that. So it's just so deviant thing to do, do you know what I mean? So that's kind of the area where we grew up and UCC is not that far away. You can walk there in 10 minutes, but it's, um, it was so far off already out of me as well have been in another country, you know, uh, UCC wasn't for people like me. We, UCC was a very um, elitist institution as we've seen it for rich people. Now, this is not the case. This is just our perception because there was nobody really in the area going to UCC. Um, all the services as well, hospitals, colleges, everything is on the south side. And the north side in general is a neglected area. And, you know, you, you, you feel um, there's a stigma attached to being from that area as well. Um, the language people use towards us when we're playing sports as children, if you're playing in another area, you can be called a knacker, a scumbag, um, dirty, all these um, labels you're given, not just by young people, but by adults on the sideline as well. You know? So then there's an element of a self-fulfilling prophecy comes with that. You know? and for a lot of young people, they do live up to that label that they're given. You know? And there is a culture of... like behind every stereotype, as you know, behind every stereotype, there is an element of truth and joyriding is a problem in Aknaini and drug use is a problem and we're way overrepresented in the criminal justice system. Um, Cork Nortley, which is the HSE district, Cork Nortley has the highest rate of benzodiazepine prescribing in the country. Um, it's like it's like a medicalization of poverty, really, if you know, because I, that benzodiazepine, like why why are people looking to be numbed? Why are people looking to be tranquilized? It's because of social exclusion and poverty, you know. But anyway, that's the lang of where I grew up. And it was inevitable, I suppose, for me, before I ever became in before I ever got into addiction, it was always destined. You know, as soon as I picked up, it was always going to be addiction because the core conditions were there for me, you know. I grew up in a home. Well, like two loving parents that loved me, but did not not so much each other, and uh, there was a lot of conflict in the home. And um, 
my father would have went to prison when I was young. Um, when I was about 12, um, and that had a big impact. Uh, I went from all bo- uh, a, a mixed primary school into an all-boys Christian Brothers secondary school, and I didn't make that transition well at all. I, I did really badly in secondary school. In spite of being bright and having ability, I just couldn't concentrate because there was so much going on. For me personally, I couldn't sit still. Um, there was no support offered either, you know, for family and for myself, you know, it was just like, go outside the class, go outside the door, suspended, expelled, these things. I was eventually, eventually I did sit my leaving cert, but I hated school and I had no value in education. Um, and the only reason I did the leaving cert is because my mother was adamant that if we did nothing else, I did that, you know. And I remember leaving exams early because the World Cup was on, you know, and that was my mentality around education. I didn't care about it and I did the basic amount. I did two foundation subjects and five ordinary, I think. And I passed it, but the amount of points I got, I could count on my hands, I'd say. Um, even the, the thought of points, I, I, I couldn't tell you how many points I got. We didn't, I didn't really care. CSO applications and SUSE, none of that was in my vocabulary. You know, we just didn't talk about any of that. You know, college, the way I seen it, school was a nightmare for me. And I left feeling stupid and feeling worthless and it caused the, con- the trouble I got into in school caused a lot of conflict for me at home with my mum. Um, very hard to manage. You know, I had two younger sisters and an older brother and my mother was on her own for the most part. And um, it's not so easy trying to manage everything and then I'm getting into trouble every day in school. You, know, you should imagine like my mother would have been under a lot of pressure there. Um, so when I finished school, I moved out of home nearly straight away. And... Um, I was experimenting with drugs, I suppose, up to then. But when, as soon as I left home, then I really took off with the drugs, you know, and I used every day alcohol, like drinking every day. Um, we used, me and my peers, there would have been a big gang of us. Like, we used to drink every night down the lane, where, you know, we'd always have cans and bottles and, and stuff like that. Um, and that was the culture, you know. It's, we were working out as well, and I was 17, 18, you know. It was around 2004, 2005, you know, we had a, an economic boom at that time, Celtic Tiger, there was a lot of work. Um, so I was in and out of jobs, losing jobs. One, the, the way it was back then, you could lose the job on the Thursday and you'd walk into a new job on the Friday. There was just so much employment there. But I didn't value it, you know, I didn't, my, my head wasn't in that, it wasn't in the education, it wasn't in the work. I just wanted to get stoned all the time. Um, and when I look back, like, why did I want to get stoned all the time? What was I running from? I was running from a, a low self-esteem, really, very low self-esteem, um, low self-worth, poor self-image, um, very um, negative, I suppose, a very negative outlook on life. Um, one second, because the dog just came in. One second. Oh, Sorry, that's that's uh, Zeus, my 18 month old staffy, and he's very nosy and he's wondering why I'm not in watching the, the hell, you know. But, um, hey, get in, Gillian. Sorry about that. <laughs> Don't ever work with children and animals, it's true what they say. But, yeah, so. Throughout my teens, because I think of my experiences in school, what was going on at home, um, I became withdrawn from school, from sports. I dropped out of sports. I became a very hurt young fella as well, um, a very angry. And when you're a child and when you're a parent taken out of the home, you're getting suspended from school. It's all negativity. It was all was negativity. And in school, it was all negative attention. And I suppose I craved that kind of uh, male role model and I found it in the street, really. Um, when I was on the street, I was taking drugs, and the drugs was always, it was about quelling that anxiety affair as well that I kind of always kind of had in my stomach. Um, if anybody here, like anxiety is a big issue for a lot of people, uh, and some people here might be able to relate, but it's just going on with the constant fear, the constant anxiety and insecurity. That's the way I used to be, you know, I was always, so insecure and so afraid and of what really I didn't really know. You know, I didn't like 
I, all I know is when I took drugs, I was relieved of it. I didn't care, you know, I was, I was more confident and outgoing and I could go about mundane daily tasks like going to the shop or the doctor or whatever. Then, but once I didn't have drugs in me, it was like, I couldn't function, you know. Um, and it was various drugs, you know, I suppose like typically smoking hash and drinking alcohol led on to ecstasy, led on to benzodiazepines like um, Xanax and Valium. Um, and then that led on to um, heroin eventually. But I remember my decline really was very quickly. I remember I did my leave in sort in 2003, in June 2003. And um, I was in court prison in October 2004 for, uh, I can't, what was it for? Do you know what? I got caught with a lump of hash at a UB40 concert in Mill Street and I never paid the fine. And um, that was my first taste of prison. It was only a couple of days. And I remember I was afraid of my life going in there because I was a scrawny 18 year old. But there was a part of me excited as well because this is where my father had been. This is where some of my friends were and their family members were. And so many people from my community was in there. And it was almost like a rites passage, you know. And on my behalf of people to believe or understand that, you know, whereas some communities, somebody goes to prison, you know, it's like, oh my God, he's, he, that his son is after going to prison, you know. And, but in my area, there was just so many family members had people in prison in that area that wasn't something so drastic, you know. It was like, um, and for for young for us like that, it was prison was never a deterrent either, you know. And I soon adapted in prison, and um, being in from a, a rough area and on the street in prison, it's similar kind of environments in terms of you have this facade that everything is all right and that you're tough, you've no feelings, and it's machismo, it's the same, you know. And I adapted really well in prison. Um, but I think once I started using heroin, um, things got really bad for me, which they tend to do for people using heroin, you know. And there was no more work and climbing, or there was no social side of it and drinking with the friends. There was that was all the fun, all that was gone, and like there was a lot of fun involved. In, being a 17, 18, 19 year old, no responsibilities, no concept of consequences, just drinking and taking drugs. Like, that is a fun, like if, if you think of, you know, when you're an adult and you have responsibilities and you're, you have employment, you have um, you have employment, you have relationships, you have your college and deadlines and all. And like, when you have a lot of pressure like that, we all, and I, I, I do, and I can only speak for me, but you might be able to relate, relate with this. When you have a lot of pressure and deadlines to meet and um, juggling a lot of adult balls, like, all you want is to just say, wouldn't it be grand if we could just fucking put everything away and get Langer's drunk for a few days, you know? That's, but when you're, that's the way we used to be, 17, 18, 19, no work, never, didn't want to work, education, you may forget about it. Nobody thought of that. And it was just about, getting as drunk and as stoned as possible. Um, so, and it was fun for the most part. For a lot of the time, it was fun. But like, it, it, the fun runs out very quickly, you know. Um, and especially when the heroin came in, all the, the social circle kind of broke away. The drinking and the social side of life finished. Um, and it's around 2000 and, it was around 2005, 2006. Um, and you might know that in Dublin, they've had a heroin epidemic or they've had a heroin problem in Dublin, Dublin since the late 70s, early 80s, 79, 80, 81. That was when heroin came into Dublin, not just Dublin, through Manchester and um, Birmingham, Liverpool as well. Around that, that was kind of when it kind of hit. But we never had that in Cork, um, really. You know, there was one or two, but we, heroin was never something that was um, prevalent you know, or accessible. And I, I think like when heroin became big here in Cork, if you look at anybody um, doing some research on, on this, you know, the Health Research Board have great uh, statistics on that. But if you look at people access and treatment in Cork for heroin use in the 90s and the early 90s, there's, there's nearly nobody, you know, like single digit figures. Of, and if you look at the graph, very low numbers, 2005, 2006 starts to creep up. And 2014, it peaks very high. Um, and we've kind of plateaued then along since 2014, you know, for people access and treatment, people being arrested for possession of heroin. It's kind of plateaued. It hasn't got worse in the last few years. It's just kind of become stagnant. But why did it rise after 2005, 2006? 
there's a couple of theories. One is that we had a prison here off the coast of Cove, a little island called Spike Island, and that was where a lot of the young people from my area, the Joyriders, would have went. It was like a, it was a youth detention facility, but there was under 18s there as well. Ten, generally about 17 to 24, they would have went to Spike Island. In 2004, Spike Island closed down, and a lot of the Cork young fellas that would have been in Spike Island got sent to St. Patrick's Institution in Dublin and Mount Joy in Dublin. And I think that they may have picked up the habit and the connections for heroin and brought them home with them. Also around that time, we had a big recession. Um, and if you look at any of the cities where they had uh, explosion in heroin use, poverty is a huge indicator. You know, poverty and social exclusion. So for people that didn't have the money to emigrate to Australia, Canada and America, like a lot of people did around 2006, 2007, for those that were left behind, you know, feelings of worthlessness because there's no more jobs and there's high rates of unemployment, people's confidence, self-esteem, mental health deteriorates, and all of a sudden you have the lads coming out of prison and they're bringing these connections. All of a sudden heroin becomes really available, you know? And what are people looking at around times of recession? They're looking for something to dull the pain, to pass the time. And that was kind of around the time where I started using heroin. And we smoked it for a period of time thinking it was um, a, a, a more a more a safer, more non-addictive way to use it, but we were really naive and it ended with intravenous drug use. It, it always does, it just to takes a little bit of time, but it'll always end in the needle. The needle is a lot is way worse because when you're smoking heroin on tin file, it takes you a period of time to get rid of the drug because you smoke it on uh, you know, you put the bag on the tin file and it takes you no know, while to smoke it. But when you use it in the needle, the whole lot of it goes into at once into the bloodstream and it's just it can be very dangerous because sometimes you don't know what's in it you don't know if it's strong or what's mixed with and overdose can be very frequent so around that time um i was going in and out of prison it was around for possession of drugs mainly you know getting caught with drugs and caught with drug paraphernalia and going into prison and uh, theft and stuff like that to feed the addiction you know but i never classed myself as a criminal even though I committed crimes, which sounds like a ridiculous statement to make. But I was just a very hot, hot person that was trying to soothe his insecurities and soothe his psychological issues and you know, the traumas that I experienced. I was self-medicating when I look back. What was the drugs? It was not, it was not party time. It was, it was about you know, using opiates and benzos to numb and dull everything. You know? And going in and out of prison wasn't benefiting me. It's not as if, or I, like, the way they have it these days is if you get caught for the, the policy in Ireland at the moment is decriminalisation for two offences, for two possession of drugs. So if, if you get caught for possession, if you're on a chronic addiction like me, and you get caught for possession of drugs once and twice, so at the second time you're going to say, oh, I better, I better not use drugs anymore or else I'm going to get a, a conviction. No, you're not. It's a ridiculous thing to have in place. You know, it'll only ever suit a student maybe who gets caught with a bag of cork and rag week or something and they can avoid a conviction. But for the general, for the most people in addiction, prison and courts is not a deterrent. You know, the, the whole the whole definition around addiction is pursuing the drug and, and use in, in in despite adverse consequences. You know, so it's not like adverse consequences doesn't stop addiction. You know, so it's ridiculous sending somebody to prison and court um, for that. But I suppose that when you're in that then, especially when you're using intravenously, you feel very low and worthless because I'd say nearly in all societies, a heroin addict is looked at the lowest of the lowest in society because it's seen as a very dirty drug. Um, and and I suppose going back to that graph I was telling you about in heroin use in Cork peaking in 2014, you would hear a lot in the Cork radio stations about um, the, the heroin problem is getting worse and worse and what are we going to do about the heroin problem? It's actually not a heroin problem, it's getting worse and worse. What has gotten worse is a homeless problem. Um, homelessness is at epidemic levels for the last few years, you know, and what happens with heroin users is they become homeless and heroin use is a very visible drug because when they become homeless, um, they'll use on the street. So what you have now is not an increase in heroin use, but it's just become more visible for those who use it, you know. Um, so that's kind of, I suppose, 
one true academia allows you to look at these things with a critical eye and 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 do your research and make up your own mind, you know. But the language used for heroin addicts, it, it does always tend to be negative, you know, for the general public. Um, why can't they just stop? You know, junkies, dirty, associated with um, hepatitis C and HIV and AIDS and, you know, sex work and begging, homelessness, all these things go hand in hand with um, heroin use. Um, and it's just... When you're when you're uh, when you are a heroin addict, you notice you're very acutely aware of all this, you know, and you feel terrible, you feel dirty and worthless. And I felt all that, and it would really isolate Jenny. I stayed away from family for Christmases and just stayed on my own in squats on my own. Um, and I was using a lot on my own, and I overdosed a few times as well and hospitalised. But for the grace of God, somebody found me in time. Eventually, I got into a treatment centre in 2013 in June. Um, and I was there for about six months, and I finished that. It was the hardest thing I ever did, you know. And once, once I got out, then I got a, a um, Cox Simon Community Homeless Charity here. I got a, a bed in a house off them, which was a recovery house, sober house. Um, I was there for a year, um, and I went to a lot of meetings, did a lot of therapy, all these things that just was to do, just kind of had a new outlook on life then, you know, once I got a bit more confident. And that's then when I went back into education, you know, I was very anxious going back into education because I didn't know that they do damage to my brain. Was I going to be able to retain information? What was my cognitive ability? Was the damage done, long lasting from drug abuse? But no, there wasn't. I, I did um, a level five further education course in the College of Commerce, Social Studies and Psychology. And I really enjoyed that. And I did a bachelor's degree in community work in Cork, in UCC. And at the end of that, I got an award, excellent scholar, and I got a scholarship to study the masters in criminology. And at the end of that, I got a, I, I got a first class honors there. And um, my dissertation was published in the International Journal of Drug Policy, which I was very proud of because I know it's not typical for a master's student to have um, a publication in an international journal like that. So I was delighted with that. Then at the end of that course, I was after getting, um, I won another scholarship and I'm doing a PhD at the moment. Um, I work in that cool mine addiction services in Cork. I'm team leader for the South Side. So there's, I'm team leader. I have five project workers and we um, we are the community drug and alcohol services for the Cork City South Side. Um, and I, my PhD then is around my employment. It's an employment based scholarship. You know, so um, it's a part of my work. You know, so I, I'm really grateful to be able to work in an area work for an organization like cool mine and in the field where i should be you know i feel very at home in the addiction and recovery and to be able to help people uh the way i was helped you know so um I cannot... look i'm happy to take questions if you have any thanks Jen. yeah look it's, 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 a, it's an incredible story I, I watched you back on the tommy tiernan show there recently and i remember you saying about that night that you had your most serious overdose that you actually couldn't you didn't care if you overdosed or got stoned off it that it was it was that and to now be in a position where you're able to help people like you was incredible yeah i remember that night um when that was towards the end of my using i was over in blarney street here which is not far from where i am now um down a kind of an alleyway between sunday as well and blarney street it's a very it's a poorly lit area in the middle of the night you wouldn't get much traffic people walking i had an overdose there and uh I was phoned by somebody and they locked the paramedics arrived with the guards and I, to give you an naloxone, which is an, an antidote for opiate overdose. And it instantly works. You know, you wake up sober and I just walked to my cousin's gaff, my cousin's house, and not really realising what would happen, you know. And then the, I met the two the two guards a few days later, you know, and they were saying, you know, James, we know you a long time you now and this is a new law for you, you know, you're going to be found dead, you need to look after yourself and... You know, my interaction with cards up until that day it was not a one of compassion and kindness, you know, it was always a cat mouse type of a thing, you know. I was expecting where you're going, you know, where were you last night? I want to question you for this search, you know, that's what I was but when they stopped me and they showed me concern and empathy, you really take notice of that. And then I, I really had to look at myself and think to myself, you know what, I'm actually going to be found dead unless I, I make changes in my life. And um, I, I made a phone call to the treatment centre not long after, and thankfully 
they survived long enough to get the bed in the treatment centre and they didn't look back since, you know. I, I have a few quick questions there for you and I might let uh, I might let it open the floor then, but yeah. you uh, you talked about your few uh, short sentences in prison and you talked this on the, on the podcast before. How were you treated in society as someone with a conviction? Um, it depends on it depends on what field of them. It, it generally, the issues come around employment. Um, so because you, you can have a conviction like me, like if I presented to you, you would never know my background unless I told you, you know, I, I'm not the, the fact now that I probably have a, a public, uh, a public figure now in Cork, you know, because I have this podcast and I was on the telly and stuff. But if I didn't do any of that and you met me on the street or you met me at a, in the shop, you would never know my background, you know. So in that sense, it doesn't really impact me. It, it might not really impact me. Where it does impact me is if you're going for employment. If you're going for employment, especially if you're going for employment with big multinational American companies, the American companies are very strict on drugs and convictions and stuff like that. Or in my sector, where you're working with vulnerable people, especially, if you're working with vulnerable people, you always have to be guard vetted. And guard vetting is just a process where the employer gets a statement from the guardie, which is just a sheet of paper, which outlines every conviction you've ever had and the dates they happened. So the problem there is if I go to, if I'm going for a job, but now in, in this job I started a couple of weeks ago, had to do that. But thankfully they were able to say he's after doing a lot in the meantime, you know, give him a chance, you know. Um, if some employers, they'll use it as a way to filter out the candidate, you know. So let's say if you're going for a job and there's 10 candidates shortlisted and you're the only one with uh, convictions, it's very easy for HR to write, we we'll get rid of him, you know. Um, and that's the problem. Um, also, if you're going for the job where the, in the application, sometimes this is, if there's an application where it says, have you ever been convicted of a crime, tick the box. You, if you tick the box, you'll know like that you're not getting the job, you know, and that's a big problem. Um, Outside of that, it doesn't really impact me, you know. But for for people in employment, I've known people. I've known people that have been in jobs, and they've HR has found out they've had employment or they've had convictions and they lost their job. It is a form of discrimination, and uh, it does stop people uh, reintegrating. Especially if you've if you've done years of therapy and and college and stuff like that, and then after doing all that, you're blocked from getting employment. It can be very disheartening, you know. Between your own experiences, James, and, and when you've been working, how do you think we can better support people from, pretty young people from marginalised areas in the city? Um, it's a very complicated question. It's a very complicated issue, really, because they say if you're a youth worker in a marginalised community like mine, and you're work, you might have a couple of hours with a young person in a week, right? And you might do great work with that young person in the week. Um, but then that young person is going back to a home where the father is beating the mother, the mother is addicted to benzos, the father is addicted to heroin, um, there's mental health issues in the home, there's drug abuse in the area, there's criminality, there's very hard, it's very hard in spite of your best efforts, you know, so it's, it, 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 and it can sound very disheartening, but there is this thing in psychology of this one good adult, you know, you can be that one good adult. Um, and that's where you have to keep the hope, you know, that if that child is going back to a very traumatic home, um, at least for the couple of hours you have him, he's safe, he's loved, he's showing affection, he's showing attention and positivity. So that's kind of where, where when I was working in homeless services, um, that's kind of what I was on to. I knew the people that was in the homeless services. They had very dangerous lives. There was lots of violence. There was lots of drug use, sexual assaults for the girls as well. Um, and it feels like that. What can you actually do for them? It's like putting a band-aid on a big, huge gash. But you just have to take solace in the fact that for the hour or two that they're with you, they're going to be looked after and you can plant the seed, you know, and, and you can try and nurture the seed. And hopefully they make it through that crisis. And when they're ready, that they'll tap into the knowledge that you've given them, you know. But I think there's nothing we can do to help people like that without addressing general dep deprivation, inequality. You know, there's no drug policy or guard of vetting policy or young person's policy going to be 
and it is going to be useful if you're going to have uh, perpetual poverty, you know, in spite of government policy to address um, crime and drug use in areas like mine, like, you know, my Ross and Limerick and Ballymun and Dublin and all these other areas. The problem persists year after year. It's a perpetual cycle of criminality, poverty, social exclusion, mental health. You know, so a lot of the time, these areas aren't prioritised, you know, um, and I think without making it too political, I think with the Fine Gael and the Fine Gael government, and I'm not that political, but I just see that they're always the people in power. And this, when I hear them speaking in denial, I think that they're just very out of touch with, they don't, they don't, when I hear them speaking, I don't feel like that they represent me or people like me or people like my area, you know, they don't speak my language, I can't associate with them. Um, and I don't see them, I don't see my community prioritised in their policies, you know, so, um, but at the same time, you're doing what you, what you can do with your volunteer and myself, and I'm doing what I can do in addiction services, and that's all we can do, we can only do what we can do, um, and trying to help individuals and groups, you know, but we really need um, a change of policy, change of heart in the government. Yeah, last thing from me, you know, very quickly. Uh, you've spoken before on the podcast about the, the language we use around uh, well, drug use and alcohol use and the danger of the word addict, addict or addiction. You know, tell us a bit about that. Yeah, that's a minefield, right? That is a minefield because there's people in recovery that they, they'll, use the, they, they'll use the term addict to describe themselves, right? So, and I wouldn't be... A one like I would never call anybody an addict, but if they choose to describe themselves as that, who might say they're wrong? You know, there's this thing in um, anthropology. Um, anthropologists, unlike sociologists, anthropologists they go into different cultures, study the culture from within the culture, and become immersed in it and stuff like that. But they work from a place of cultural relativism. It's the idea that no culture is superior to the other, and we don't judge a culture based on another culture. You know. Um, and all cultures and norms are valid and relevant to that context, you know. So the way I, in this, taking that principle into this field, I think that we have to respect if people want to use terms to describe themselves as an addict, as a recovering addict, as, you know, somebody in addiction, you know, these are, but I, say, I think the problem lies then is if you're a researcher or if you're an academic or if you're a professional, not to label people, you know, and use kind of person first language, like people who use drugs or people who have used drugs, I think would be more appropriate. Like you would, um, people who have autism, people who have a disability, instead of labeling them as autistic or disabled or addicted or an addict, you know, because we all know people are much more than their diagnosis. And if somebody, like if I am um, a recovering addict, which I am, I'm way more than that, you know, I'm way more than that, so I don't like that label, but at the same time, I'd still describe myself a part of me. I Yes, I am I am in recovery from addiction, but I don't like if people label me an addict, you know, because I'm way more than that. But at the same time, I wouldn't get too upset about it either. I think these are arguments that we can waste a lot of energy on, you know, and I think that we're better off to use our energy for something more meaningful. But at the same time, notwithstanding, Language is also important. Uh, definitely. I know there any questions there from the room. We can uh, you have a couple more minutes there before I let you go. Margaret asked, um, what word do you, you use instead of addict? Um, as I said, I would describe myself, if somebody asked me, um, I, I would say I'm a recovering addict. That's what I would say about myself, you know. But if you were to describe me to somebody else, you could say that too, you know. It's, as I said, it's a minefield. But if you're looking at the literature, there's a whole body of literature on these terms we use to describe people in addiction. But it's generally people who use drugs. You know, that's kind of the general rule of thumb, you know. It's using the person first language, you know. Um, so people who use drugs are people who in recovery. Um, yeah. Oshin, there, do you have a question? Yeah. Um, thanks very much, James. That was a that was a brilliant story, and 
Cheers for sharing. Um, what what tools do you see that you could use um, in sort of including more people from marginalised areas in academia and getting them through second level education and into third level education? I suppose the there's I touched on something a while ago. Social capital. There's all these forms of capital are important. Like economic capital is important. There's more to college than fees, you know. Um, like t in theory, anybody in Ireland can go on to third level education because we have Susie Grant and we have, you know, back to education allowance and all these things. But why are we still way underrepresented in UCC? Because it's not just about economic capital. As I was saying earlier on, like if nobody in your estate or family ever went to UCC, you know, why are you going to go there? You know, it's just it's it's it, you know it's just the culture. It's just you don't have you not to gauge, but you like if somebody calls to you or Sheen when they say a few years down the line and you uh, or Sheen Og is nineteen and or seventeen doing his leaving sort and he he's going to college. He wants to be a doctor or he wants to be a teacher, and he said that I want to be a teacher and hopefully you're living in a nice area. You know, and you're doing well for yourself. You say, you know what? Paul down the road, his daughter is a teacher. Let's go down and ask them, you know, how they go about it. Or across the road there is um, Fiekra, his daughter is a teacher. Or she says, son down there, he's, you know what I mean? In an area like that, you've, but in areas like ours, there's no teachers. You know, you've nowhere, you don't have that social capital, that cultural capital, you know. So I think what could help is having more mentoring programs, you know, may, maybe making UCC and Monster Technological University more pre, more of a presence in the north side. You know, it's it's all basically centered on the south side. You know, we don't have any symbols up here of UCC. You know, I think it would be helpful. Like if you, you know yourselves, if you're in anywhere near the city center and and to the west of it, it's nearly all UCC and CIT. You know, every second building is UCC logo on it or. School of Music, School of Played Social Studies, School of Psychology. There's, you know, but we, the young people up here, they don't see any of that, you know, so it's just seen so abstract and so far away, you know, so um, it's complicated, but it's not just about um, money, it's just about, you know, um, that lack of, um, or it goes back to this thing, you can't be what you can't see, and you're never going to think of becoming a teacher or becoming an academic or becoming a lawyer if you've never known anybody has ever done that, you know. Sinead, there's going to throw the last question in. Hi, James. Um, yeah, thanks. Uh, you, you mentioned that there was um, a lot of interrelated problems facing these communities. Um, and I was just curious if you think that any one of these are most pressing for the government to, ad to address at this stage? Yeah, homelessness, I think, is uh, the number one issue at the moment. In Cork, like before COVID struck, there would have been a lot of homeless people in Cork, you know, visibly homeless. I know you can, like if you walk through Cork, especially down by the Keys where people would have been drinking, they're not there no more. So the homeless hasn't been eradicated, just people are in hotels now. And even for people that don't use drugs, that are in home, like families in hotels and families in B&Bs, no, this is a huge problem and you're going to be dealing with the consequences of that. Then in in areas of social housing, um, maybe people aren't homeless, but you four, a three or four bedroom house with 10 or 12 people in there, you know, grandparents, down to grandchildren and everything in between because there's nowhere for people to move. So people can't afford rents even if they have the price of the deposit. You know? People can't get on the social housing because there's just so many people and so little housing stock. Um, so this is the big problem. And I think that you're, like you'll know from in psychology again, you know, you can't look to address anything in your life if your basic needs aren't met. And your basic needs are shelter, warmth, you know, very bottom of uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you know. How can you look at college, employment, and love, and belong, and all these things if you don't, if your housing situation is precarious, you know, if you're living in a one room B and B with your three kids, or if you're living in a tent in the city, or if you're sharing a house with 
three siblings, your mom and dad, your two kids, you know, this is the big problem. Um, and it's just about really taking the rental market into the hands of the government and regulating it like they do in other European countries, you know. Don't have, like, even home ownership in Ireland wouldn't be such a big ordeal for people if we could rent with safety, but we don't because anybody in the rental market today is too precarious and it can be whipped for Monday at any minute. The rents can be hiked, you could become homeless, whereas in other European countries, you don't have that uh, obsession with buying your own home because rent is relatively safe and it's relatively cost effective and secure. So I think that housing is probably the main issue at the moment. Thanks, Jane. I'm very conscious now not keeping you too long, but just to, to signpost two things there for everyone, as you can see, James could tell us for days about all the uh, the knowledge he has in the area. Uh, both his podcast, The Two Norries, is a fantastic listen uh, if you want to uh, check that out. But also next week, we'll send you the link. James is on a, a panel discussion with uh, Dr. Sharon Lambert and Peter McFerry about uh, advocacy and building services for, for marginalised groups. So Again, he, it's going to be a, a fantastic listen to that as well. So we'll send you the link to that as well. Other than that, though, James, I'll, I'll let you go. Thanks a million for coming on. You've been a, a fantastic guest speaker. No problem. Thanks for having me. And look, uh, enjoy the rest of your evening. I'm going to watch uh, Man United play Roma there now. So see you later. Thanks very much, James. Cheers. Bye. Bye. -bye. Right. So we said that. Um, we are going to go in there to very quickly into just two small groups to have a quick chat about that and check in with you to see how you're doing. Unless, Fia, there's anything else? Uh, no, I think that's all. Um, we'll split up into the groups. And um, do we want to just give it 10 minutes or do you want to give it the, the full 15? Or... Should we see if it goes? Yeah. 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 Um, and then once we close the breakout rooms, you can just leave straight away because I know sometimes we end up back in the main room. But if you do, just, just fire away. Uh, thanks for joining. I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, we'll make the recording available. I'll also stop the recording now. Um, so you will, <laughs> don't have to hear any more of my voice. Um, so thank you. I'm just going to drop it in something very quickly before everyone disperses. Um